for the first time on these matters. These are matters for which over 80% of Ugandans are either novices at law or have failed to understand. And almost 100% of security agencies have refused to understand. There is a difference between Rwandans and Banyarwanda. Rwandans belong to Rwanda. Banyarwanda is one of the indigenous economic, uh, indigenous cultural, I mean, communities here in Uganda. So what does the constitution say? When everybody reads the third schedule to the constitution of the Republic of Uganda, they actually tell these people that they are Ugandans and they are provided for in the constitution. I am sure all of you have heard about it. Now that is not the law. A schedule is just a list. The law is what generates a citizen of Uganda. And that law is under Article 10 of the Constitution of the Republic of Uganda. That law states that for one to be a citizen of Uganda by birth, you can be born either in or outside Uganda, it doesn't matter, but either of your parents or grandparents must have been a member of an indigenous community in Uganda as at 1st February 1926. Now, that is the provision. The provision makes the following regards. Number one, you can be born in Uganda. Number two, you can be born outside Uganda. Number three, either of your parents or grandparents must have been members of an ethnic group. Number four, that membership can only be determined as at 1st February 1926. Now the Constituents Assembly made a mistake. The first mistake is lumping ethnicity with the citizenship. And I want the media to understand some of these things. They are legal matters, but they will assist you while making analysis on many of these kinds of issues. Number one, ethnicity and citizenship are completely two different things. Why? The laws governing ethnicity are international laws, not country laws. Why? Because ethnicity is extraterritorial. You have got Maasai in Tanzania and Kenya. You have got Banyarwanda in Uganda and Rwanda and Congo. You have got Samias in Kenya and Uganda. One time we had a minister for ICT in Uganda and his brother was a vice president, Mude Awori, in Kenya. But coming from the same home. So you don't use ethnicity and modern law prowess to determine citizenship. That was a legal wrong by members of the Constituent Assembly. That is number one. Number two, Citizenship is the subject of national laws. They call them municipal laws in proper legal English. They are only determining the relationship between you, the legal bond between a person and his government, the person and the state. Now, those are laws that are so narrow that cannot be determined using lenses of ethnicity. That was a legal wrong by members of the Constituent Assembly. I put it to them that they erred. Number three, the threshold of 1926 was anomalous, malfeasance, 
malodorous and it was a nuisance introduced in the constitution. Because 1926 has nothing to do with Uganda. Uganda started in 1962 and whatever existed before that was a protectorate region. There was no Uganda and you could not determine citizenship but protected citizens before 1962. Now, where did the CA delegates pick 1926 from? First of all, it is the alien. And in contra contrivance with the all provisions of legal authority in Uganda. It was never captured in 1962. Nobody talked about 1926 as a threshold. The constitution of 1966, nobody talked about it. The constitution of 1967, nobody talked about it. Where did they pick it from? At the subconscious level of some of the framers of the constitution, they had some jostling for... You know, the president of the Republic of Uganda gave two directives to the Constituent Assembly. The first directive was to recognize Banyarwanda as an, an indigenous ethnic community. The second one was to establish term limits of two term limitation in the constitution. So the framers of the constitution started power struggles, thinking that now who must be ahead in the queue to replace President Museven after the two terms. The Banyarwanda that had contributed highly to the revolutionary struggle of 1986 were seen as those that are likely to take over from President Museveni. So they designed a mechanism by Chikenale that introduced 1926, well knowing that immigration and migration of Banyarwanda started and ended by 1959. So most of them, accordingly, would have been kicked out. And the CA delegates that were Banyarwanda did not see that. So it was a target culminated and calculated to otherwise estrange these Banyarwanda from citizenship of Uganda in order to take care of their own interests in terms of the queue to taking power. Now, that anomaly has generated a very serious legal wrong. Banyarwanda cannot obtain passports. They do not have citizenship rights. National identification is always picked from them as and when the officers would prefer. There is a lot of havoc now that has been visited on, on the Banyarwanda and the interpretation of 1926 only gives the credence to the geographical Banyarwanda that allocated in the districts of Mpororo, Ntungamo, Chisoro, those whose lands were carved out of the former Rwanda Kingdom. The rest of these people from Boganda and all the other regions are not citizens of Uganda by birth. Now, there has been a, while, a wealth of jurisprudence on this. I have even had some lawyers suggesting that they would run to constitutional court. Now, let me teach them that constitutional court is for citizens. Once you are declared a non-citizen, then you have no claims before the constitutional court. But I can also tell you that they are not alone. If you can look at the authority of Anudo versus the Republic of Tanzania, that is a matter before the African Court on Human and People's Rights. That was decided. Anudo was a Tanzanian, born in Tanzania. He had a Tanzanian passport and a Tanzanian national identification. But when he was registering for marriage, because I can tell you that these people are not even eligible to execute marriage vows that will be understood and properly considered under the laws of Uganda. In fact, none of the women here can become widows upon the death of their husbands because they are not citizens of Uganda and accordingly are not eligible to have administered any marriage contracts in Uganda. So Anudo, once he reached out to the authorities in Tanzania for obtaining a marriage certificate, 
He was arrested. His passport was confiscated. The national identification was also removed from him and thrown into Kenya that he is actually Kenyan. On arrival into Kenya, he was quickly arrested by Kenyan officials for being an illegal immigrant, imprisoned, and now deposited, in, not in Tanzania, but in what we call no man's land. Now, this is where they are going, if this is not handled. No man's land. Until an organization called Open Society intervened and rushed to the African Court on Human and People's Rights. And that court is actually anchored on the following agreements. Number one, the African Charter on Human and People's Rights. Uganda is a signatory. The court is established by a protocol on the African Court on Human and People's Rights. I know I am boring you with the law, but this is where it is the first origin of the whole problem. It is the origin of this whole problem. And anybody that seeks to tell you cheaply about what it is, is majorly telling you that he has got substantial ignorance about the matter. I have seen a lot of people that actually are ignorant about this, but louder about it. And I can tell you that that means they are always wrong in their loud manner. So what happened? Arbitrary deprivation of nationality and citizenship is illegal. Now, Uganda being a signatory to those two provisions, the protocol establishing the African Court on Human and People's Rights and the African Charter on Human and People's Rights, which is also captured under Article 6D of the Treaty for the Establishment of the East African Community, to which Uganda is again signatory, and also owing the constitutional, international constitutional obligation and Article 2 of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. The hands of Ugandans are tied. The government of the Republic of Uganda must quickly address Article 10 and delete 1926 threshold and establish what we call the juicy soli principle that where you are born is where you are a citizen thereof. They are born in Uganda. Their children were born in Uganda. Grandchildren were born in Uganda. Therefore, they are Ugandans. Any attempt to deny them Ugandan citizenship by birth is intended to establish a state of statelessness towards them. Now, when you are stateless, what happens? There is no legal bond between you and the state. The meeting at Chiangkwanzi was stopped because, among other reasons, that there is ADF in, in, in Kassanda. Okay, ADF have no legal bond between them and the state. You are also sending them to have no legal bond between you and the state. So, which group are they going to join? Is it government or ADF? What we are doing is to solve the problem for Uganda. Security, on the other hand, is interested in furthering this problem because they are interested in budgetary increments. Once this exists a little longer, it means their budgets will continue to exist a little longer. So security agencies are interested in take home than the future of this country. This is a warning. We are gentle, but we cannot guarantee gentility going forward. We have issued a schedule of consultative meetings. These meetings are calculated to make sure we consult on a memorandum that we have produced advising government on the amendments that we need in the Constitution of the Republic of Uganda and the laws on citizenship in Uganda to correct the wrongs that have been created over time. The citizens of 1962 cannot be declared non-citizens by 1995. Nobody had the authority to do that, not even the Constituent Assembly, because 
the assembly was not creating a new country. They were only creating better laws for a country that existed in 1962, that had been misgoverned, that had been malgoverned. Therefore, without that authority, whatever they did can be amended. The problem with the people of Uganda is that under our law, we are not allowed to petition the African Court on Human and People's Rights. And do you know why? Because the Attorney General, the big man, has refused to deposit a declaration allowing Ugandans to sue in that court. That declaration is required under Article 36, Clause 6 of the Protocol for the African Court on Human and People's Rights. Why are we delaying? It is an inordinate delay. You sign a charter, you refuse to oblige under the protocol. It is okay. We are piecemeal handling the exigencies of refusal to allow citizens to access freedoms. One of the first steps we have done is to elect one of the most gentle persons in Uganda to lead the Uganda Law Society. It is okay. We will handle slowly. We are very meticulous on the things we are doing. And I am surprised the people are not aware. We are not children. We are not novices at law. And this battle will be pursued to full length. Therefore, the IGP is now fully put to notice that a schedule of consultative meetings has been provided. We have held these discussions with leaders of the country, including the president. Therefore, a new IGP, really, I think you are being an activist if you think you are going to stop this procedure. Probably you have not checked well. Behind you, there is a portrait of former IGPs. Probably yours is about to also be pinned up if you do not koto to prescribe the procedures that Ugandans actually prefer. With those, I think the, the matter will progress to its logical